All right, hello everybody once again, and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio. I am Bobby Munson, and I am joined as always by the man with the angelic voice. He is the throat with the goat. He is my video bro, Papa Smokes. How the hell you doing? Hey, how you doing, Munson? And all, how all you wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully, everybody's staying safe, staying healthy, and enjoying what you can about professional wrestling these days. And you know what? There isn't a lot of it out there. So what you got them to do? Come to listen to two guys talk about some wrestling. And we got a lot of that to talk about today on our very special all NWA wrestling episode. Papa Smokes and I are both big fans of the NWA. And we wanted to do a very special episode where we talk about the history, the lineage of the NWA. And we're also going to talk about some modern things. And this all came about, Papa Smokes, about a recent few comments that were made. Uh, in particularly, Raven who was seen being interviewed for De Devin Nicholson's Hannibal TV. And Raven was quoted as saying, I think Billy Corgan's shutting it down, from what I hear from the grapevine. So Raven making the claim that the NWA is going to be shutting down. Uh, immediately when I saw this, read this, I was a little disappointed. But again, I don't take everything I read and see Lightly, I don't think that everything can be immediately assumed as being true when somebody comes online and says something like that. So I'm glad that Billy Corrigan came to Instagram to make a rebuttal to this. Here is what Billy Corrigan had to say in response to what Raven had to say on Hannibal TV. Corrigan says, A quick note about the National Wrestling Alliance, which I fought for and won ownership of a few years back. We are not shutting it down. So please disregard any and all rumor to that effect. The NWA is not and will not be for sale. And those talent under contract will remain under contract for a reason. Which is that we at the NWA are trying to figure out a way to provide our great fans with wrestling content in a very, very tough environment. And most importantly, keep our talent safe and the standard of production you've come to expect from us at a high level. Anything less, in my opinion, is unacceptable. So yes, appreciate the interest, appreciate the chatter, don't appreciate the unsourced rumors and speculation. Sincerely, William Patrick Corgan. And all I gotta say to that is, amen, Billy Corgan. Man, I respect the hell out of this guy. You know what, I grew up respecting his music, Papa Smokes, and I respect him even more as a wrestling personality. Was the last guy I ever expected to be a personality in wrestling that I would enjoy and respect, but man, all the credit to Billy Corgan and what he's done in this in, in the NWA so far. Yeah, I got to agree with that too. What a what a well thought out statement that was. Uh, timely and uh, and precise in its wording, in that he wants to uh, encourage uh, the fans to uh, not listen to the dirt sheet rumors so much, or the uh, wrestlers' particular rumors. Uh, he's he's fully into wrestling. He's fully committed to the NWA and. Uh, you got to remember Billy Corgan, uh, uh, like you said, I, I was also very surprised to hear that he was a wrestling fan. He never struck me as that kind of a guy, always a musician and a more artsy kind of guy. I didn't see him as a wrestling dude, but uh, when I first heard that he was uh, joining TNA Impact as a, as a writer and a creative kind of worker, I, I, I was very surprised, but... Uh, yeah, he's been through the ringer in wrestling already. The the guy uh, when he tried to he worked for TNA, and then when he tried to buy into it, I know uh, Dixie Carter only wanted him for his money. She didn't uh, she didn't want to give him any of his uh, stipulations in terms of creative control or anything like that. And she he, he basically just lost a lot of money out of that deal and never did get ownership of TNA. So. Uh, Billy's been wronged in wrestling before. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't uh, doesn't like uh, the allegations that uh, he's out of money and that his uh, company is going to fold. So bravo to his statement, and it gets it out there nice and clear for the rest of us listening. It sure does. And you know what? Uh, I mean, credit to everything he has done with the NWA. Uh, it's been very, very successful, in my personal opinion. I've enjoyed watching it, especially, you know, NWA power came almost out of nowhere. I did not know what he had planned when he purchased the NWA. We had seen a few things with the 10 Pounds of Gold series on YouTube. But when the announcement finally came, the NWA power was coming to YouTube, I was excited and I wasn't sure what to expect. Were we going to get, you know, a little taste of the old school or was this going to just be another new school type wrestling company with an old school label on it? 
fortunately for us as fans, we got to see a little bit of that old school kicking it with the new school guys, which was what made NWA Power so enjoyable to watch every week on YouTube. It's been something I've extremely missed during these COVID times, and I'm hoping that they can get back to doing some tapings again very soon. Um, NWA, I mean, there was a lot of great things that they had going on there, aside from the talent. I mean, even the commentary, I mean, from Joe Galley, he was a great commentator. I mean, he held his own uh, up there with Jim Cornette and Stu Bennett there on commentary uh, quite a few times. They had excellent singles matches. They had a great focus on the tag division, the women's wrestling there. Absolutely wonderful, great breath, fresh air, in my opinion. NWA Power, just uh, overall great show. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what you said. I, I really like, uh, one of the things I like about it the best is that it it kind of reprises the old uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling TV show. I, it, it looks like it's done in the same place. The ring looks the same. The logos look the same. They've hung the flags up over the over the ring to uh, signify that it's an international promotion. And uh, I, I just as a TV show, I, I think it looks awesome. I like the small... Uh, crowd just on one side of the ring kind of thing and the rest is uh wired for tv and yeah they have a great roster it's not overloaded they started small and used uh good wrestlers they knew they could trust and then started to build from there and again it's just a shame that covid came along when it when it did for the new companies that were just beginning you know our our parent company ppw included uh, just kind of getting that first year out of the way and then and then the covid19 thing happens and we're all forced to stay home and wait and, and stew in our juices waiting for when we can get some good new content and same thing for nwa power it seemed like they were just getting going and getting some real good momentum when uh, this happened so with that being said nwa power great show obviously we both enjoyed it uh, what's one of your greatest memories from nwa power there pop smokes that you can remember that maybe fans that haven't watched it yet might want to go back and check out well i thought it was kind of fun that for one thing, they used the uh, the ten pounds of gold, the the domed belt uh, for for Nick Aldis, the champion. But then they brought the old championships back too, and including the TV title. And in true uh, television title style, they held a little round robin tournament to, to crown a winner. And and I found that good. It was a uh, they used all the talent. Uh, everybody had a match in that, and then uh, eventually crowning the, the the champion Ricky Starks and. The same old belt uh, that they used to have in the 80s and 70s, presented to them by a, by a former uh, NWA television champion, Nikita Koloff. I just, I like that bridging uh, the gap between the old and the new, and that, that was a big moment for me in NWA power. For sure, and speaking of, like you mentioned, Nick, all of this uh, and the 10 pounds of gold, I mean, got to, got to, say right now i'm credit to nick aldis 640 plus days as the champion so far i know that definitely uh with things being on hold with covid that makes a big difference but you know i was doing a little research pub smokes and found out that nick oldest now ranks as number nine in all-time champions that have held the 10 pounds of gold in terms of both the reigns and the uh, the amount of time and days that he's actually held it with now just barely behind a few other guys to start ranking up there uh, going up further up that ladder. I mean, it's going to be a long road to ever get to, you know, some of the guys that have uh, had those long legacies with the title and everything like that, like Lou Thez and everything. But, I mean, credit to a guy in the modern era to be holding a title as well and everything that Nick Holdis has done with such uh, gr grace and turn it into such a prestigious belt once again. Yeah, yeah. We have to remember, too, that uh, Nick Aldis wasn't touring with the belt and wrestling five nights a week like some of those old champs were too, such as uh, Ric Flair and, and Harley Race and Luthez, like you mentioned. But uh, yeah, still uh, uh, Aldis, uh, kind of like the uh, figurehead of the company. Uh, they wanted a, a classy champion that, that, that uh, represents the company in, in a noble way. And uh, they, they have that with Aldis. He looks the part. He wears the expensive tailored suits. He... He carries himself and that and that famous famous belt like a real champion, and uh, he can spearhead uh, the NWA going forward. Definitely. So, and one of my absolute favorite moments from NWA Power, if people haven't had a chance to go and witness it, is the seeing of Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton, the Rock and Roll Express, winning the tag titles, the NWA Tag Team Championship, for the fifth time. And I say fifth time. 
not because they have been back and forth winning these belts over the 19 or so episodes that the NWA power has existed, but this is why we're talking about the NWA today, because this is a storied lineage and history behind this company. And Robert Gibson, Ricky Morton are a part of that history. And now, with that being said, we're going to start going and talking about some of the history of the NWA. So, Papa Smokes, why don't you let people who are tuning in, maybe for the first time hearing about the NWA, know a little bit more about the history of the company? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, before the NWA, there was uh, there was a uh, in the early part of uh, the 20th century, uh, uh, the early 1900s, was a uh, there was a world heavyweight champion, but it was really a name only, and uh, it was it was uh, operating out of the large metropolitan area of kind of New York, New Jersey, and Boston. And uh, the first uh, heavyweight champion in that area, at least, was George Hackenschmidt. He traded the belt back and forth with uh, Frank Gotch a few times. Both incredible wrestlers, incredible shoot wrestlers, as we talked about on the past here in the past here too. And uh, it wasn't until uh, 1948 that, uh, that a bunch of the regional promotions, particularly in the South, but, but across the U.S., decided to form a conglomeration, basically, where they would crown one world heavyweight champion. That champion would thereby take that belt and tour through all those smaller territories all throughout the year, defending the belt each night against that particular territory's top guy. Uh, typically, they would have a match that was quite competitive and quite close, and the, the, those t regional fans would be left thinking, damn, our guy almost beat the world heavyweight champion so close, thereby making them making them continue to believe that their uh, promotion is can hang with the big guys in the wrestling world, that, that they have some of the top guys in the U.S. as a, as a wrestling federation. So... Um, yeah, they would. They had membership. They had. Uh, I think they started with seventeen members or something. This would have been Munchnik and Gulas and uh, Paul Bosch and all these guys in the uh, big promoters in in the old days. They used to meet once a year in Las Vegas and have their meeting, and I'm sure have a little fun on the side as well in Las Vegas. But uh, they would have their meeting. They would uh, and all take votes on on where the uh, championship was going to go which guy would get to hold it for a while. They, they were uh, somewhat taking turnsies, I suppose, in uh, having, uh, you know, the, the Mid-South guys in, in Memphis might be saying, yeah, well, we want uh, our top guy, Jerry Lawler, to hold it for a bit. And then the guys over in Georgia are saying, well, we got Dusty Rhodes, we want him to hold it. And the guys down in Florida are saying, we got Ron Fuller, we want him to hold it. So they, they, they would vote on that. And uh, that's how they, they, they all decided not to compete with each other, but to form a, a governing body, basically. And that's what they call the National Wrestling Alliance. All the promoters getting together, making the decisions that would go on for uh, the World Heavyweight Champion and then taking it from there, uh, uh, agreeing on dates. And I don't know all the minutia of all the uh, business that they talked about, but that was the thing. They decided to all get together stop competing against each other and start all making money centering around the world heavyweight champion of the NWA. And wasn't it prior to um, Vince Jr. taking over a uh, company from his daddy that his dad, Vince Sr., actually sat on that governing body as well too, even though the WWWF at the time was not recognized as an NWA company, Vince Sr. still sat on that board making the decisions and working uh, in conjunction with the NWA and the other governing bodies in professional wrestling at the time. Yeah, that is true. <clears throat> Vince McMahon Sr. and the other big promoter from the kind of New York, Boston area was a Toots Mont. He was uh, he was in cahoots with Vince Sr., but they, they sat in the NWA. They, they were into it. They all believed that uh, they could each help uh, each other make money. And I think uh, in the large... Uh, urban areas such as New York and Boston up in the Northeast, they were they were also kind of thinking that uh, they had large operations compared to some of the smaller promotions. They were going to use that as a as a farm team kind of situation too, where they could they could trade talent and also uh, pick talent up from the smaller federations as well. It eventually uh, eventually uh, 
Toots Mont and, and Vince Sr. started thinking they were probably a little bit too big for the NWA. They didn't want to they didn't want to go by the NWA mandate. So they quit for a while and then joined up again. But it was yeah, it was when Vince Jr. bought the company from his dad that uh, he didn't want to play ball. He he wanted everything for himself and he wanted to compete with all the other uh, promotions. And ultimately, from what I've seen too, is uh, many state that it was when Vince Jr. started bringing the cable television product into many of the territories that that really ultimately halted the NWA stronghold in terms of their uh, power, uh, governing body that they had. And that's when life changed for the NWA, essentially, from what I've come across. Uh, that was when they started going into using their name to help startup promotions at that point in time. Uh, ultimately, first and most well-known was uh, helping WCW out in the 1980s, around 1985, that they allowed the NWA Heavyweight Championship to be used in WCW television right up until about 1993, I believe with Ric Flair being the last one to hold the title under the WCW flag with the NWA belt. Yeah, but I think by Flair's time, they had the, the big gold belt. They had changed it from the uh, the domed globe belt to the uh, the big one, you know, the, the, the big gold belt, as they call it. Uh, and uh, that's when Flair took off with that to the WWF. That was uh, quite the controversy and such like that, too. But, uh, yeah, uh, Jim Crockett had sold. Uh, Jim Crockett was the last remaining of the big territories when uh, Vince's nationalism started taking over the wrestling business and uh, he ended up being highly in debt and, and his only choices basically were to declare bankruptcy <clears throat> or sell Jim Crockett promotions which was the biggest uh, the biggest and strongest promotion in the NWA and also the last one standing operating out of North Carolina so he ended up selling his company to Ted Turner Ted Turner wanted a wrestling show on his channel, so but he he also saw the business changing, so he didn't want it to be the old NWA still or Jim Crockett promotions. He changed it to uh, World Championship Wrestling and and uh, got a big TV deal or put it on his own channel, I suppose, and uh, that's where that uh, war started out too. And then from there, they uh, the NWA would continue to use their championship also to help other startup companies. I mean, yeah, WCW at that point uh, decided to go their own direction, and as you said. And after that, they immediately went on to help out another company that I'm sure a lot of fans out there might not realize that at the start of ECW, they were using the NWA ECW Championship up until 1994 when Shane Douglas was officially crowned the first ever ECW champion, and they actually literally trashed the NWA championship on ECW television once yeah. Paul Heyman took over the company. Yeah, well, wasn't that an awful thing, too, to see the belt of such legacy and such greatness uh, treated like that by Heyman and his punks there, too, uh, throwing it on the ground and trashing it. Uh, a, a sad moment, but it was, it was all dictated by business and the way the business was going, and uh, that's the way it was going. It was starting to be thought of the NWA is being uh, outdated and uh, and uh, like your grandfather's wrestling, not your wrestling, you know. And that being said, you think that that would have killed off the legacy right there, but no, the NWA just won't ever die, and that's what I love about it. They went on to then help out another promotion after that, uh, working in conjunction with the Jarrett family, Jeff and Jerry Jarrett, and starting up what was officially known as NWA TNA Wrestling at first, using the NWA TNA Championship, which you, as many people listening might know, eventually became TNA on their own inevitably, and eventually Impact Wrestling as we know it today. But at the very incarnation of the company, they were under the NWA label, known as NWA TNA over there. Yeah, and they had the domed globe belt, and uh, you, you saw various people such as uh, Jeff Jarrett and I think it was Christian Cage that had it when uh, NWA finally wanted to uh, end this merger and uh, force TNA to, to make their own belts and uh, and uh, renounce the, the uh, association with the classic NWA organization, which, which I think was fine with uh, Jared at the time because Jared was just running uh, NWA TNA as one company 
and uh, uh, wasn't wasn't uh, ever checking with the NWA Championship Committee or any, or any of the owners of the NWA about title changes or, or belt changes or anything. And the uh, the NWA didn't like the legacy of their belt being defended and won and lost on on one promotions TV show. So they just said that we're, we're more than that. We're bigger than that. You don't get to use our stuff anymore. We're a we're a a national company. So even though they weren't by that time, they didn't have any financial strength or uh, or really any uh, influence anymore. But uh, that 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 happened for a while there with TNA. That's for sure. And then from there, I mean, a lot of modern fans might not know this. Uh, they very much they're familiar with Ring of Honor, but might not be familiar. But the early days of Ring of Honor and a particular pay-per-view known as Reclaiming the Glory, where the NWA finally crowned a brand new champion that night in Adam Pearce, where he would go on to, you know, become quite the NWA champion himself for quite some time as well. And, you know, a lot of people should go back and find out that lineage. I mean, the NWA championship has really found its way across many of the different companies that you may know today. Uh, I mean, aside from any of the new startups in the last few years or anything like that, but that 10 pounds of gold has made its way across quite a few territories, quite a few different companies, and had quite a lineage, and a lot of different people that have held that belt over time. Yeah, they were working with uh, Adam Pierce's kind of home company or promotion that, that was in uh, Hollywood, California, I think it was. I can't remember the actual uh, call name of the promotion, but uh, it was called uh, Wrestling Hollywood or something like that, and that's when uh, Pierce had the belt or was close to it for five years there until uh, they set up that tournament with, the, uh, it was a seven, best of seven match series against Cold Cabana. By the time of the, it was doing well actually, the, the series, uh, people were getting interested in it again. And by the uh, time of the seventh match, once again, NWA pulled out and, and uh, took their belt again and said, uh, yeah, we're not just with one promotion here. Like we're a, we're a historical company. We we want this belt to be shared all throughout uh, promotions throughout the U.S. And the, yet they didn't really have that deal set up, so it kind of was anticlimactic. They left Pierce and uh, Cabana hanging there, and uh, those guys were public in their disgust about it afterwards. They threw the belt down and. Uh, and uh, gave little shoot interviews afterwards where they just said, this is bullshit, basically, and uh, you guys are trying to get it going again. We're trying to help you get it going again, and then you pull this shit on us in the last match of our little series here, and then there is no champion. How does this help you? How does this help us? How does this help our promotion? So, yeah, that went poorly, too, and I think uh, it lay dormant for a few years after that. I find it quite interesting, though, that all these companies that the NWA has helped out seem to have found a lot of success under the NWA label. And it seems like once they kind of hit that pinnacle where they think that they're getting to that mega success and stuff like that, they feel like they can go out on their own. And the second that they go out on their own, it really seems to plummet from there. It seems like that NWA legacy and the fact that they have maybe some great wrestling minds that are helping out with governing this kind of thing really helps to make these companies successful. And the second you start taking that away from those companies, they seem like you get a little bit of a lost puppy. They don't know what to do with themselves. And they ultimately tend to start dipping. I know that, you know, maybe some of the listeners today will argue that Impact Wrestling's had a bit of a resurgence. If you go and watch some of the quality that they're doing at the moment, they've gone to a little bit more of an independent type style. It's a little bit more interesting again. Granted, but... They did fall from grace quite fast after this, you know, descending from the old NWA TNA alliance there and stuff like that. When they really tried to go out on their own and try to, you know, do like everybody does and go after the WWE's big spotlight. Yeah, they just were left to do that without uh, the great wrestling mind of Jerry Jarrett, though, who was uh, running that TNA and. I mean, you can see TNA wrestling as a success or a failure, but the only reason it was ever on the radar in the first place was because of Jerry Jarrett, who was a, such a great wrestling mind and such a great booker from Memphis, Tennessee territory and, and other places throughout the South. And and he had worked with McMahon Jr. up in, uh, up in uh, New York as well. There's that famous 
rumor that I'm not completely sure if it's true or not, but in 1991 when there was the steroid scandal and McMahon was facing some serious jail time if he got found uh, guilty of uh, distributing steroids amongst his workers and, and forcing them to use them in order to keep their job. He was looking at 15, 20 years in the can and uh, rumor had it that uh, he was going to call Jerry Jarrett up to take his place as the main promoter and the main booker in WWE because it was a guy that he knew could do the job and that wouldn't wouldn't double cross him and, and take the company out from under him while he was in jail. I always found that interesting. So uh, McMahon cer certainly recognizes the uh, the genius of Jerry Jarrett. Definitely. So and we've talked a lot about the uh, 10 pounds of gold and everything like that here on the show today. And I mean, you almost have to. I mean, that's what really, you know, set the standard for the NWA. But I mean, we'd be wrong to not talk about the lineage of the NWA 10 pounds of gold based on who's held it in the past and some of the big names that have actually held the 10 pounds of gold box smoke. I wanted to start us off by mentioning a name that maybe not a lot of people listening know. I mean, some of the names we're going to come across, they've heard of in some way, shape or form throughout the years. But the first ever NWA heavyweight champion, Orville Brown, would be the name that comes up. Yep. A man that held the belt for 501 days and only had to give it up due to an early retirement due to an automobile accident that ended his career long before it should have been ended. Yeah, and that accident happened right before his big match against Lou Thez. So regardless of whether Brown or Thez was going to go over, once that accident happened, it was I, I think they just had to award the belt to Thez. And uh, yeah, if anybody knows anything about Lou Thez out there at wrestling fans, I hope you do because he's one of the best to ever lace up the boots. Uh, yeah, just a champion of class, a, a shooter or a, a hooker, as he called himself, because if he got his hooks in you, you'd be tapping out in a in a big hurry. But Fez had some records for longevity holding that belt as well, uh, touring all throughout the States, uh, uh, making insane money, making more than the top baseball players, the top football players, the top basketball players, any of those guys. Fez was making way more money than those guys, the boxers and everyone, and uh, con conducted himself as a gentleman and as a sportsman and uh, and wasn't the kind of guy that was interested in gimmicks and angles and storylines in wrestling. He liked it straight up as a athletic competition and uh, Fez really set the bar for, for having that classy, uh, uh, skilled champion holding that belt. Well, and he's known for holding that title at least for over 2,300 days in that first run that he had it, uh, to the point where they started referring to it as Lou Thez's belt. Yeah. And, you know, and then he would go on to have a little back and forth with the title and stuff like that. Uh, he lost it to Leo Nomaleni, but won back in a rematch. Did the same with uh, Billy Watson in Toronto, Canada, reclaimed eight months later in a rematch there. And then once again with, uh, Ed, uh, sorry, Edward Carpenter, and then won it back 40 days later in Montreal. So Lou Threz, many, many runs with the NWA, 10 pounds of gold there. Yeah, and you see what they're doing there too, is that he's touring and, and wrestling the top guys in every promotion, including uh, Toronto with uh, uh, Whipper Billy Watson, uh, Montreal with Edward Carpentier, and, uh, and Leo Nomalini. I'm not sure where he would have been at that time. He was a former football player, but... He would have been in some big city, Detroit or Chicago or L.A. or something like that. And, yeah, maybe you might do a little trade of the title here and there. Let uh, let the local boy hold it for a bit. Let the fans see that. Let the fans realize that their promotion has equally top guys with uh, the best wrestlers in the U.S. And uh, it, it makes money and draws people all the way around. Now, seeing as you're a great wrestling mind when it comes to the old school of wrestling, Papa Smokes, I was going to run through a few other names that have been help, uh, known for holding the title belt in NWA and see uh, if we can get a little bit more information from you on them, see, see if we can pick your brain. I'm going to start with one, uh, Pat O'Connor, known for the uh, crown belt version of the NWA, 10 pounds of gold. Yeah, I, I, I know O'Connor, uh, I haven't seen that much of his work. I know he, we've all seen the Pat O'Connor role, which is the... Uh, pushing your opponent into the ropes and rolling them up reverse that that's still used as a common pinning maneuver 
that's the probably the most I know about Pat O'Connor, but a famous, famous wrestler from the past. Obviously a big name, Buddy Rogers. Yeah, Buddy Rogers uh, was another one of those uh, cool guy champions with the fancy suits and everything, and uh, everybody liked him. He was a great athlete and stuff, but uh, he was also kind of, uh, as, as I'm led to believe, a uh, kind of a sketchy businessman, uh, did a few deals that people didn't really like and uh, promised a few things and never delivered and such. So uh, I think his career was kind of cut short a little bit, uh, shorter than it would have. And he ended up uh, being in the WWF and uh, was the first champion until uh, Bruno Sammartino beat him. Yes, and uh, speaking again, Bruno Sammartino, another one that held the title as well too for the NWA. Uh, another name, Killer Kowalski, also on that list. Another oh, big yeah. name. And then uh, one that we talked about recently on the show that I'd love to bring up again, Bobo Brazil. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Big Bobo. And he's he's got to be uh, amongst the first handful of uh, colored heavyweight champions too. And, and uh, yeah, good to have him in the lineage as well. i got to bring up this name just because we're going to call him the 775 champion because of the very few limited runs that he had as the champion, but Giant Baba. Yeah, yeah, Giant Baba, uh, the, his promotion in Japan were also members of the NWA, and uh, they traded talent, of course, and we've all seen the famous video of the NWA wrestlers going over to Japan and having all those wild matches, such as Brody and Hanson, and, uh, and oh, God, it's endless, the Funks and uh, the Briscoes and all those guys used to wrestle over there, and Giant Baba was was uh, uh, head of a huge, huge promotion, and and uh, yeah, he wanted his run too. I think he beat Jack Briscoe for it during uh, the beginning of one of the Briscoes tours, and then uh, you know had it for a week or something, and then Briscoe won it back and brought it back to the states, and that's the way the deal worked. Yep. And then yeah, you mentioned a few guys that I had on the list as well too, and obviously some names that are you know going to be you know, pretty clear to some of the fans of uh, wrestling nowadays. I mean, obviously, people are very familiar. Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, all really well known for that. But a couple of other names that uh, I'm going to throw out there, uh, Carlos Colon was one of them as well, too. Yeah, uh, uh, head promoter in the Puerto Rico, uh, I think it was called WWC back then. And they were uh, strong members of the NWA and, and those... Uh, all those wrestlers used to go down and do those wild shows in Puerto Rico, too. And then uh, Ron Garvin, another one as well, too. Yeah, yeah, I didn't realize Ron. Oh, yeah, Ron Garvin held it. Yeah, he beat Flair in the in the cage for it at one point. A short reign, but, uh, you know, he's in the record books. As well, yes. And then a few others, uh, Barry Windham, Chris Candido. Yeah. Uh, maybe not a lot of people know this, but for a while, actually, Dan Sabern held quite a record as the NWA champion as well, too. Yeah, Candido and Severn, I think, won it when... Uh... The NWA and the WWF made a deal with uh, Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and were hosting that for a while. And, and they they wanted to get it. They wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, they wanted to use the NWA belt in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling for a time. So they held a little uh, a little tournament. Chris Candido was the first champion, and Severn ended up holding it too. And then I'd be. Again, I got to go back to uh, some modern times as well too. I mean, Tim Storm has been a great champion in modern days for the NWA, a wonderful yep. champion, and had a great feud back and forth with Nick Aldis, which has really, I think, a lot of ways brought a lot of that prestige back to the NWA 10 pounds of gold and really put it on the map with the modern day fans that want to pay attention to this particular style of professional wrestling. Yeah, Tim Storm brought uh, uh, pride and legacy to the belt as well, and uh and uh, still active now, so I, it's fun for it's fun for fans to realize that he's an ex-champion, or might even be a several-time ex-champion. Fun to watch him uh, chasing the belt again, chasing down Aldis, and uh, just trying to get that belt back. Definitely. So, and then you know we uh, 
wrapping up this portion of it anyway, uh, Cody Rhodes, we're going to mention him as well too. Cody Rhodes got the opportunity to wrestle Nick all this for the championship. I believe that was on a Ring of Honor pay-per-view as well too, where Cody finally got the opportunity to hold the belt that his dad Dusty Rhodes had held in the past. So a great moment there for Cody Rhodes. A great matchup with Nick Aldis, in fact, too. And then the rematch at NWA 70. Wonderful matchup. Nick Aldis finally getting that chance and winning the title back. And, man, he's been on a tear ever since. Nick Aldis, that wonderful, graceful champion, 640-plus days. And, honestly, Pop Smokes at this point. I'm rooting for the guy to go on to uh, hold one of those uh, legacies in wrestling that really stands out, especially in a modern day when you see titles flip-flopping back and forth between just about everybody who whines and cries that says that they deserve a championship nowadays. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, and uh, until they find someone uh, suitable to unseat all this, I think that he will continue to be the figurehead of the company, uh, holding that beautiful old belt up high. But just like you said about uh, uh, Cody Rhodes uh, winning the belt that his dad had, I mean, I mean, just as a physical belt, that that ten pounds of gold, that dome globe belt, like that is the belt you want in wrestling. Like, you know, the WWE is the bigger company, and and they have a very uh, very colorful past with that too. But uh, man, yeah, myself as a you know, if I could just pipe dream for a moment here if i could hold a, a major championship in wrestling it would it would so be that that dome globe belt that's the one with the lineage that's the one with the long history that's the one that's had all the greats holding it it would be an honor even just to hold it in your hands i think because uh, it's such a, a valued piece of history in wrestling well i'm going to put it out there right now papa smokes that uh because of our involvement with PPW, if Billy Corrigan, Nick Aldis, or anybody involved with NWA ever happens to be tuning in and listening to this by any slim chance, and you're hearing <laughs> this right now, you know what, feel free to contact myself and Papa Smokes because we would absolutely love to be able to be part of that lineage and have the NWA championship make its way to Saskatoon to be defended here on a PPW show. I think that we would love to be able to harken back to the legacy of the belt and the way it was traveled around to go against some of the best guys in the territory. And I think we have some incredible talent that would be able to put up a great matchup against Nick Aldis, the uh, real world's heavyweight champion. Well, that's, I like the way you shoot for the stars months and that's dreaming big for sure. But uh, don't forget it was only uh, three years ago that we had the ROH world title uh, de defended in Saskatoon. So it's not completely uh, crazy to think. Exactly. So, I mean, hey, if there's ever that opportunity, we'd be down for it as well, too. But uh, from there, uh, Papa Smokes, what else can you add for the fans? Anything else that you want to talk about on the NWA's lineage and history here today on the show? No, I just I want to send my uh, wishes out that, uh, that NWA power uh, uh, under Billy Corgan uh, gets going again and gets up. I really think they have an awesome product there. I really like watching it. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, fans will keep watching it on uh, on YouTube as well. And uh, is it helping to support them with a little bit of merch and maybe some pay-per-views and stuff. And uh, very entertaining wrestling. A nice slice of the old school in uh, today's modern car crash wrestling uh, atmosphere. And uh, I'll, I'll keep watching it. I just hope they keep putting stuff out. And uh, the NWA's lineage is important in my life too. I've watched... Uh, a million hours of, of, of uh, NWA-based uh, wrestling on TV. I would just love it if, uh, if it keeps going. Definitely so. And again, I'll say, I'll say it. If anyone in the NWA is listening and you're ever looking for a commentary team or backstage personnel or anyone to just help you out, Papa Smokes and I are here for hire. We're glad to help out anytime. <laughs> so Billy Patrick Corgan... Reach out to us. Papa Smokes and I are available to come and help out with the re revamping of the NWA once it gets up and running after these COVID times. But, you know, it's been great, Papa Smokes. I'm glad that we got this opportunity to sit down and talk about the NWA, the lineage of the NWA, and just talk about some old school wrestling that doesn't have to involve any of the new stuff that's going on at the moment. I mean, a lot of what's going on at the moment, I'm hearing a lot of the same arguments from fans alike is that it feels like 
nobody cares about it in wrestling anymore. It's almost like it was a hot topic a couple of years ago. And with what's happened now in these COVID times, the big guys have given such, you know, and I'm not even afraid to say it, they've given such fucking garbage on the television for most people at the time that they're starting to really get a distaste for professional wrestling. I mean, you and I have been through and seen so many different eras of professional wrestling in our time already that, I mean, I think we're used to this hot, kind of hot and cold bump with the way things go in professional wrestling and stuff like that. And hopefully COVID doesn't completely kill what excitement there was for some of these fans out there. And hopefully that once things get back to some sort of normalcy, we'll get to see some great in-ring action again and get to see a lot of fans out enjoying these shows and showing love and support for some good professional wrestling. But once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Ring Respect Radio. We really appreciate it right here on the Video Bros Network. If you enjoyed the show, we get going to ask you to go ahead and give us a thumbs up. And if you really like it, go ahead and give us a subscribe. Turn on that notification bell down below so you know whenever we release new material right here on Ring Respect Radio. Thank you once again for tuning in, folks. And from Pop Smokes and I both, have a great day.